Good morning, dear students. I'm just talking to you from a city called Ribeirão Preto in the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Unfortunately, I couldn't be with you today. It was some sort of misunderstanding in the scheduling of the, my lecture. Uh, and then it seemed inappropriate to try to postpone it and find a better time. So I just came up with this solution, which I hope uh, suits every one of us. So my name is Jordi Altimiros. I believe we have met already in this master program earlier. Uh, and my job today here is to talk about uh, G-protein couple receptors, GPCRs. The lecture just for practical reasons i'll break it down in three parts and each part will be a video on its own the first one will be to discuss the main features of gpcrs their diversity and the signaling and that's what you are going to be listening immediately the second part is going to be on beta adrenergic receptors and actually heart failure beta adrenergic receptors are those um, G protein couple receptors that are best known. And finally, I will be discussing on orphan GPCRs. If the technology allows us, I'll be following this lecture live via Skype so that you can actually ask questions at the same time. However, just for practical reasons, uh, I, I thought it was better to separate the lecture, which is going to be found in YouTube, from the possibility of me joining via Skype in case that does not work. Mm -hmm. So, so let's see if I can find this pointer right. Here it is. GPCRs, G protein kappa receptors, are the largest family of membrane proteins in the human genome. Very important protein. When they are bound to their ligands, G proteins are stimulated through the intercellular domains. Essentially, it means that the receptor basically binds with its ligand and immediately as the interaction results in an activation of the heterotrimeric G proteins, heterotrimeric because they consist of three different subunits, alpha, beta, gamma, that when they dissociate, basically trigger the intracellular effects, either via different options that we will see later, the most common one being adenylyl cyclase and the formation of cyclic AMP. Uh, G, protein couple, uh, G proteins actually have no catalytic activity, but it's actually uh, when they dissociate that they trigger these uh, intracellular effects. And their important role is in the propagation and the amplification of the signals inside the cell by modulating of the activity of these uh, effector molecules that we were talking about. It's an important fact that G protein couple receptors have a large ligand diversity. As a common superfamily of molecules, they share a lot of structures in common, but then they are able to bind to two numerous ligands, as you will see here and in the next slide. Uh, G protein couple receptors have biogenic amines as uh, ligands, and that includes adrenaline, dopamine, histamine, acetylcholine, many neurotransmitters, and many hormones as well. Uh, G protein couple receptors have also peptides and proteins as ligands. And in here, basically, I would say that pretty much any hormone that you can recall from previous courses, you will find in this long list of uh, molecules that interact with G protein couple receptors. G protein couple receptors also have ligands as binding as uh, ligands uh, also have li uh, lipids as ligands, eicosanoids, purines, and nucleotides. Uh, this was disputed once upon a time. There was no belief that nucleotides could actually trigger or have uh, membrane receptors, but they do, uh, the purinergic receptors. And finally, excitatory amino acids and ions such as glutamate, calcium, and GABA also work through the activation of G protein couple receptors. If we look at this from a structural point of view, you will notice that each one of these ligands are structurally different, but they are able to activate G protein couple receptors in many different ways. For example, if you take those uh, 
hydrophobic or partly hydrophobic uh, ligands, such as amines or nucleotides, eicosanoids or lipids, the interaction tends to happen inside or in the intracellular, in the, in the, in the plasma domain uh, region. But for peptide hormones and receptors, it is usually the extracellular uh, part of the receptor, the one that is involved in this interaction. We have other cases, much more exciting and exotic. You have the case of the uh, PAR receptors, the protein activated receptors, uh, in which the protease is the one that is actually cleaving part of the receptor, as you he see here. And after cleavage, a portion, the extracellular portion of the receptor uh, itself is the one that activates uh, and does the receptor activation. Later, you also have glycoprotein hormones that interact and trigger conformational changes, as well as neurotransmitters such as calcium, glutamate, or GABA2. What's interesting is that all these structurally very different ligands actually interact with G protein couple receptors. And historically, from an evolutionary point of view, you can see that all these GPCRs actually originate from the canonical GPCR, which is no less than rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is actually a pigment. It's a pigment that is activated by protons. So actually all GPCRs uh, evolutionarily seem to originate in a protein, uh, uh, an actual uh, pigment that is activated by photons. And notice the diversity from a photon activated molecule, the diversity of different ligands that you can find that actually result in this gigantic or really large family. G protein couple receptors uh, have been classified, this big family has been classified into different classes. And these different classes are actually found uh, or can be found. There is the most recent classification can be found at this website. You have the class A, which is actually uh, molecules that are similar, are similar to rhodopsin and the class B that are similar to secretin. Secretin, for those who may know or may not remember, secretin is actually the first uh, hormone that was discovered is a gastrointestinal hormone is released by the, I believe, the small intestine. And then you have two other classes, the C and other smaller classes that include some receptors that I'm not going to talk about uh, much. But notice that among the A and the B classes where you find most of the hormones that uh, you are, uh, that, that you have studied previously or that you have heard from previously. These G protein couple receptors interact with heterotrimeric G proteins, and these heterotrimeric G proteins consist of alpha beta gamma subunits. The ones that have received the most attention are the alpha subunits. And in here, I, you have a terminology in this table of different types of alpha subunits. I'm going to pay particular attention to the ones that are circled in red. And here you have the S. G alpha protein, the I alpha protein, and the Q alpha protein. S stands for stimulatory, I stands for inhibitory, and Q stands for Q. And what you will see is that each one of these subunits actually interacts with different effectors and triggers different intracellular effects. In a synopsis, the S alpha subunit basically stimulates as the S name indicates, a stimulatory of the production increase, a stimulation of adenyl cyclase and the production of cyclic AMP. Unlike the I type, the I subunit, the I alpha subunit, which is inhibitory, and that results in a decrease in a, a activation of adenyl cyclase and the formation of less cyclic AMP. And finally, the Q subtype of alpha, pro, alpha G proteins that actually stimulates phospholipase C. And that's what you will see in the next, in a sort of a summary with three examples, what I call the GPCR signaling. And the first example, in the A example, you have PTH, parathyroid hormone, which interacts, the, the, the PTH receptor interacts with a G alpha 
stimulatory subunit that once detached after activation stimulates adenylyl cyclase and that results in the increased production of cyclic AMP. So this is a, an alpha S subunit and here you have the alpha Q and the alpha Q instead, uh, the example is arginine vasopressin, triggers the activation of protein lipase C, PLC, and that basically splits up a larger molecule into two component molecules, diacylglycerol, a lipid, and IP3. And both of them have different activations. In the case of diacylglycerol, it leads to the activation of protein kinase C, one type of protein kinase that will lead on for further phosphorylation. And IP3, inositol transphosphate, that actually releases calcium depots, calcium uh, um, stores in, uh, in the cell. So upon formation of IP3, you have a release of calcium, which is actually resulting as a secondary messenger. I fail to say that cyclic AMP, in turn, in the first pathway, activates protein kinase A which is a for uh, end up phosphorylating other intracellular proteins for activation. The third example here is actually a misleading example, and I'll tell you why, but in this case, it's an alpha subunit that basically would lead to the activation of PLA2, phospholipase A2. In reality, we know nowadays that this interaction does not exist, and what's actually happening is that the activation of PLA2 occurs through the previous activation of protein kinase C via diacylglycerone. So that's how this pathway is recruited, a previous activation of an alpha Q protein that activates PLC, that forms diacylglycerone, that actually further activates or phosphorylates PKC, and that is the one that leads to the phosphorylation act and activation of PLA2. If we continue talking about the activation and the inactivation of the receptor, we have to consider that when binding of the ligand to the GPCR occurs, we have two opposing processes. The first is the actually the receptor activation and the specific cellular response I just talked about. The other, which is equally important, is the desensitization of the receptor and the decrease on the response upon activation, what I call here the turning off the signal transduction pathway. That means that once activation has occurred, immediately there is a desensitization and a turning off the signal. And this turning off the signal happens through different, three different pathways or three different avenues. One that I call desensitization, it's a fast response. We'll see in a second how it works. A second one called internalization or sequestration. And the final one, which is the downregulation or the decrease in gene transcription. Talking about desensitization, which is the first one of these turning off the signal pathways that I talked about, I'm going to describe to you the desensitization of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, which is the best studied model system. And in this case, uh, there is an uncoupling. This desensitization results from an uncoupling of the receptor from the signal transducing G protein. And this occurs because of receptor phosphorylation. So again, as we see here, Protein phosphorylation is one of the main mechanisms to actually activate and deactivate uh, proteins. And this is not different from the G-protein couple receptors. When the G-protein couple receptor is phosphorylated, it actually reduce, it has a reduced sensitivity to actually further signal or continuous signaling. And this phosphorylation actually is uh, depending on who which kinase carries this phosphorylation, it actually takes the form of heterologous desensitization or homologous desensitization. Heterologous desensitization is actually non-agonist specific. It is mediated by generic kinases such as the ones I mentioned earlier, PKA or PKC. That means that the activation of PKA or PKC, protein kinase A or protein kinase C, 
leads to the actual phosphorylation of the receptor itself in a non-specific uh, manner. That's why it's called heterologous. The alternative is homologous desensitization, which is agonist specific. And in this case, this is mediated by members of the GPCR kinase family, the GRK family. So for every given receptor, there is a specific GRK protein that will specifically phosphorylate that receptor. And here you have the example of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, in which is the GRK2, that the one that is responsible for phosphorylating the receptor. And it's this phosphorylation that impedes the further activation of the receptor, further ligand binding. At the same time, it is this phosphorylation that attracts another important protein, beta arresting, and that's the one I will be talking about in the next slide. The second of the uh, desensitization mechanism is actually the one that's called the internalization. Internalization means that the receptors are mobilized from the plasma membrane to intracellular compartment, intracellular vesicles. And this is what you see here. And this is the last step that we considered earlier where GRK2 phosphorylates the receptor. This phosphorylation of the receptor increases the affinity to binding for beta arresting. And this actually is the one that leads to the formation of inter intracellular vesicles, clattering coated pits, in which the actual receptor is going to be involved. It is this uh, endocytosis of the, the, the vesicles that actually removes the receptors from the plasma membrane, so they no longer can be activated. Uh, these receptors, once they are internalized, they can either de be degraded via endosomes or can, they can be recycled back to the plasma membrane after some period of time. Obviously, this would be the step of resensitizing the receptor. Basically, the, uh, the receptor is dephosphorylated again and it can be recycled or it can also be degraded. The important step in this internalization is actually the binding to beta arresting. As I said, this binding to beta arresting is due to the fact that there is an increased affinity once the receptor is phosphorylated. And notice that the beta arresting in this case is actually works as an adapter or what's called as a scaffold for other factors that facilitate the activation and subcellular localization of different signaling proteins. And in here, you have proteins such as adapting or clattering that will be involved in the endocytosis 